you very much for this uh, very kind invitation. Uh, I have no conflict of interest. Uh, so who I am, as I introduced, I'm an interventional neuroradiologist. And I am involved in pulsatile tinnitus exploration and treatment for 20 years. I must say that thanks to forum discussion on the net, my recruitment has dramatically increased these last six years. And currently, I explore weekly an average of 15 pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, I have two main messages, actually. First, is a pulsatile tinnitus have nothing to do with continuous tinnitus. Pulsatine one can be cured in 70% of the case. The second one is a corollary of the first one. It is therefore necessary to look for the pulsatile character of a tinnitus because nothing is more detrimental to the patient suffering from pulsatile tinnitus than the word tinnitus used without epithet. How to recognize a pulsatile tinnitus? often by paying attention to the patient complaints. And sometimes such as I hear my heart beating in my ear, or it's like the sound of the Doppler are typical of pulsatile tinnitus. Otherwise, there is a, something that I do systematically in consultation. I imitate the sound. I propose and I draw the sound. Do you hear an horizontal sound or do you hear if it's that, it is a pulsatile tinnitus. A pulsatile tinnitus is a normal perception of a pulsatile flow near the inner ear. So, uh, as I said, my two main messages is a pulsatile tinnitus has nothing to do with the continuous. Uh, the imitation of the sound or the drawing of the sound it should be systematical in consultation when receiving for the first time a patient with a tinnitus. And if the sound is like that, it is a pulsatile tinnitus. And the pulsatile tinnitus is a normal perception of a pulsatile flow near the inner ear. In other words, the sensory organ is not affected. And the pathology involves, in first intention, the vessel passing close to the cochlea and especially the lateral sinus. So the clinical and radiological exploration must be vascular and osseous. To understand, in my mind, the, the pulsatile tinnitus, one must understand, understand that all intracranial fluids are pulsatile. The arterial blood, the venous blood, and the CSF are pulsatile. And all of them can cause a pulsatile tinnitus. So the question is, how does a pulsatile tinnitus appear? There are two words, turbulency and dehiscency. Turbulency is the increasing sound of the vascular flow in the vicinity of the inner ear. A torrent is placed near the ear. Dehiscency is the disappearance of the bony envelope that normally isolates the inner ear from surrounding fluid. The pipe casing is removed. So how to explore a pulsatile tinnitus? Clinical examination is as important as radiological exploration. What I do in consultation is first, cranial, cervical, and precordial auscultation. This is very important when positive. In other words, when you hear something, but most of the pulsatile tinnitus are not accompanied by an audible sound. And therefore, one should not dispute the existence of these symptoms because one does not hear a sound of oneself. So by the way, objective versus subjective tinnitus is therefore an absurd dichotomy. The second maneuver is the compression of the neck vessel. I compress successively the internal jugular vein that is uh, out of the uh, common carotid artery, and then the common carotid artery ipsilateral to a pulsatile tinnitus, looking for interruption of the pulsatile tinnitus. This is an essential data for venous pulsatile tinnitus. The radiological assessment has dramatically changed since the beginning of my experience. The cerebral angiography is no longer the gold standard. There are two non-invasive examinations 
that can diagnose everything. The MRI provided that it is a specific MRI, pulsatile tinnitus, that see all the cause of turbulency. And the temporal CT scan that see all the dehiscency. So if one consider my classification in between venous, neutral, and arterial pulsatile tinnitus, according to the result of the compression, I will start with the venous pulsatile tinnitus because they are the most frequent. What is a venous pulsatile tinnitus? It is a pulsatile tinnitus interrupted by homolateral jugular compression, which when you compress the jugular vein, it is very depressible. You suppress the flow in the lateral sinus that carry the anomaly and you redistribute the flow into the control lateral sinus. That's why it stops. To notice, this is extremely important that many patients have discovered this technique. Their sleep is possible only with a pillow wedged under the jaw or even in the, during their daily activity, the ear only by compressing their neck with their hand. If a young woman describes you that, she has a venous pulsatile tinnitus. The first cause of venous pulsatile tinnitus and the first cause of pulsatile tinnitus in my experience is the stenosis of the lateral sinus, which affects mainly young women and the frequency is increasing due to the increase of the population of our weight. Which stenosis is this? It is called, I call it primitive, which excludes stenosis after partial recanalization of a sinus thrombosis. It is symptomatic, which excludes incidental finding. And there are three types of symptoms, isolated pulsatile tinnitus, venous, one, idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or for EMT, spontaneous dural leak, rhinorrhea or otorrhea. So how do you do the diagnosis of the stenosis of the lateral sinus? Either on a T1 GADO gradient echo or on a venous cerebral angiocity. These stenoses are of two morphological types depending on the age of the patient. It could be an intrinsic stenosis due to hypertrophy of a granulation. A granulation, subarachnoid granulation, as you know, is filled by CSF. It's a normal structure, but it may become hypertrophic. It will give you an endoluminal image inside the lateral sinus. In hyposignal, actually it follows the signal of the CSF because it is CSF without contrast enhancement, of course, and without thinning of the temporal bone. It's not a tumor. This is a granulation hypertrophy responsible of a venous pulsatile tinnitus. The second type is the call extrinsic stenosis. It is often missed by the radiologist because there is no endoluminal image. For my recommendation to do the diagnosis is to work and to examine it in coronal view. This is a normal patient in coronal view, starting from uh, behind, uh, the, uh, front to the behind. You see that the sinus remain always of the same diameter. In an extrinsic stenosis, it will be normal in, uh, in the front, and the more you, when you get in the back, you miss you, the, 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 the sinus, and then finally on the transverse part, it becomes uh, once again visible. The pathophysiology of the pulsatile tinnitus in this cause, which once again is the main cause, is a venous flow acceleration up to 10, ten times in front of the stenosis that create turbulency at the exit. And I can measure that by a Doppler uh, micro guide wear, what, what I use uh, when I treat this patient. Uh, you see on the back, uh, in the, on the transverse sinus, close to the torcular, the velocity is around 20 centimeters per, se per second, and it reaches 10 times sometimes in front of the stenosis. A part of the velocity, the transgenetic gradient is always measured. It's done 
during general anesthesia, situation where the gradient drop, and we consider significant a gradient of 2.5 millimeter uh, of mercury under general anesthesia between the torcular and the sigmoid sinus. Those symptomatic stenoses of the lateral sinus have been treated for 15 years at Leibweiser by endovascular approach by placing a stent, restoring the normal caliber of the sinus with a stent, suppress the acceleration of the venous flow, the turbulency it causes, and therefore the tinnitus. And it has a really on-off effect. This is a situation, a pulsatile tinnitus in a 20 years old woman. It was venous, interrupted by the uh, left jugular vein. There is a bilateral stenosis, but the left uh, lateral sinus is dominant, so the pulsatile tinnitus will be perceived on the dominant sinus. So this is uh, the uh, stent uh, that is compressed by these uh, sheaths, and I uh, release the stent facing the uh, stenosis. And this is the pre, uh, opera, pre initial anjo and uh, final after deployment of the stent, and not uh, the patency of uh, the vein at the level of the stent, which was one thing that we fear uh, 15 years ago uh, when we uh, start. Uh, uh, we have published our first uh, 200 patients. Now the series is uh, 360. By parenthesis, there is an indir indirect sign of symptomatic sinus stenosis, that is the excess of CSF in some subarachnoid space, particularly the cella cella turcica, or the cranial nerve sheath. This is not a sign of double IH, of intracranial hypertension. This is a sign of sinus stenosis symptomatic. So a part of this uh, cause, that is the main cause, there are other causes of venous pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, the, the, uh, due to venous dehiscency, some anatomical situation when associated with the thinning of the temporal bone can lead the cochlea to perceive the normal pulsatility of the venous flow. So in that, in those cases, there is no exaggeration of the sound of the venous flow, but exaggeration of its perception by the inner ear. Um, something that we publish was the aneurysm, we call that aneurysm of the lateral sinus. It is a sinus pouch that enter in contact with a mastoid cell which transmit the sound to the cochlea. The diagnosis is done on the temporal CT scan. You see here uh, left venous pulsatile tinnitus without stenosis of the sinus. Uh, and you see the treatment. Here it is a selective treatment by a code embolization of this venous pouch. Uh, there are dehiscency of a emissary vein. The mastoid emissary vein is a constant structure and it is non pathogenic because it is separate from the mastoid cell by bone. Such a vein here cannot cause pulsatile tinnitus because it is not decent. However, some emissary vein can become decent. We don't know why, as we don't know why there are decency. The diagnosis is established on the temporal CT scan, which shows the dehiscence of the vein in mastoid cell and the clinic. It is always a venous pulsatile tinnitus. You see how small can be this emissary vein. This is a left venous pulsatile tinnitus due to this dehiscence of this emissary vein. And once again, the tre treatment by endovascular approach, I do that under local anesthesia. It's quite simple. During the intervention, I check that I am correctly in this uh, vein by doing a CT in the under room. I deploy a small coil there, and it's, it's over. The, the pulsatile tinnitus is over. This is a cause that we have described and published recently. This is not an emissary vein. This is a diploic vein that is decent and uh, revealed by a right venous pulsatile tinnitus. 
the diploid vein doesn't drain the vein of the brain. It connects the sinus, superior sagittal sinus, to the lateral sinus, so we can analyze it with code, which was done there once again. The minor type 2 is a dehiscency of the superior semicircular canal into the superior petrosal sinus, and it leads to a venous pulsatic tinnitus due to this dehiscency that you can see there. So, second type are the arterial pulsatil tinnitus. The tinnitus is interrupted by the carotid compression. Um, the, one of the first causes is the carotid stenosis, but the carotid bifurcation stenosis does not usually cause pulsatil tinnitus unless it is hypertight with a high bifurcation, but stenosis located up. Subpetrous uh, on the subpetrous uh, internal carotid can cause pulsatile tinnitus. This is a cause that we describe and we call diaphragm or web of the subpetrous ICA. It's a kind of proliferation of the intima creating an endoliminal web. It is most often associated with fibromuscular dysplasia. It gives an arterial pulsatile tinnitus, and you see. Oh, thin is the sign. This is a subpetrous ICA. So what is the pathophysiology? There is, a, once again, an acceleration and turbulency, and the inner ear is there. So we can see well, very uh, better well on conventional angiography. To uh, verify, to check that it is the correct uh, cause of the pulsatile tinnitus, a part of the clinical compression. What I do during uh, the exploration, I inflate a balloon without uh, when the patient is awake and hearing your tinnitus. And every time you inflate the balloon, the tinnitus stop. So the treatment is the stenting of the uh, diaphragm as it was done there. Uh, the diagnosis of diaphragm can be suspected by the angio-MR MR or angiocity, where you see often finding sign of fibromuscular dysplasia, the pile of plates you can see there. And the diaphragm is within this plate, pile of plate. You see a patient with a, a disabling arterial pulsatile tinnitus, you see the uh, indentation of the fibromuscular dysplasia, the diaphragm is there, this is after stenting, that solve immediately the, the, the pulsatility. And any subpetrous carotid stenosis can give a pulsatility induced. Here, it is a sequel of carotid dissection. It is associated with the stenosis that you can see there. The, the, aner the pseudo aneurysm is not involved. What is involved is the remnant stenosis, and it is solved by the stenting. There are arteriovenous pulsatile tinnitus. Clinically, they are often neutral pulsatile tinnitus, non interrupted by vascular uh, compression. However, in arteriovenous pulsatile tinnitus, a brute is most often audible at auscultation. The first cause of arteriovenous pulsatile tinnitus is a dural arteriovenous fistula that has uh, done of arteriovenous communication is a stiffness of the cranial dura mater. It is an acquired lesion, patient over 40. And the turbulent flow is here related to the turbulency gener generated by the acceleration of the arterial bubble due to the arteriovenous gradient. So when the turbulency occur in the vein there. Clinic of the lateral sinus dural edifistula, it is a continuous murmur with systolic announcement on the mastoid when you auscultate. You hear And it is usually interrupted by the occipital artery compression. The diagnosis of dural fistula is always possible on the native 3D tough time of flight. MRI, provided that the radiologist has done a large 3D TOF from the occipital foramen to the vertex. You see on the side, on the side of the uh, pulsatile tinnitus an hypersignal of the meningeal artery in front of the fistulous sinus 
that is it. That means hyperflow in those meningeal artery. There are a second location, uh, the UAVF of the hypoglossal uh, channel, where the hypersignal will be seen medial and anterior to the gulf of the jugular. The treatment of dual levy fistula is endovascular. Uh, and there are two approaches, the transvenous uh, embolization using coil or the transarterial using onyx, which is a gel solution. Uh, if we deal with a dual levy fistula with a patent sinus, still functional for the brain, we will do an arterial embolization to respect the sinus lumen. This is after the embolization. If on the other side, we have a dual AV fistula of the lateral sinus with an occluded, occluded sinus, non-functional for the brain, we use a transvenous approach where we will pack coil against in front of the uh, AV communication leading to their occlusion there. This is another cause, a right vertebro vertebral fistula that can be suspect on the 3D TOF. You see here, there is an hyper signal and it is confirmed by the angiosity. I show you the uh, early venous injection. And it is treated by, uh, once again, transvenous embolization using coin. This is before, this is the coin and this is uh, the vertebral artery after embolization. Finally, there are neutral pulsatile tinnitus. Pulsatile tinnitus is perceived at the time of the consultation and not interrupted by the cervical vascular compression. And no brute is perceived at auscultation. So bone cause predominate. The first is the dehiscency of the superior semicircular canal described by our colleague Minor. It gives a neutral pulsatile tinnitus of dual tone usually, boom, boom, sometimes associated with vestibular syndrome. The diagnosis is done on the temporal CT scan that show a loss of bone coverage of the superior semicircular channel. In oblique view, this is a normal coverage of the semicircular, and this is a dehiscency in a minor. The pathophysiology of the pulsatile tinnitus here is the transmission of the pulsatility of the CSF to the perilymph and finally to the cochlea. The treatment, as you know, is a surgical coverage or no, what do uh, our ENT is the plugging of the canal with the risk and anywhere of vestibular syndrome if the plug reach, reach the utricule. The second cause in my experience is the autosclerosis, usually fenestral. It can cause sometimes an isolated pulsatile tinnitus that is neutral. The pathophysiology is probably the turbulency of the vessel in this dystrophic uh, osteosclerosis. The treatment of pulsatile tinnitus due to auto autosclerosis is still problematic in my experience because there is no good medical treatment. The anti surgeon only operate if the uh, aeric conduction is less than um, Osseous conduction and only do a stapedectomy, which doesn't solve the problem of uh, the tinnitus. Tympanic paraganglioma give a neutral pulsatile tinnitus. Usually it is diagnosed by ENT, and I don't see too much in my consultation. But anyway, on the T1 gradient echo, you see perfectly the injection of the tumor that is confirmed by the angiogram. Uh, another cause, intracochlear schwannoma. An intracanalar, standard schwannoma of the eighth nerve does not cause pulsatile tinnitus. But if it is intracochlear, maybe by a bell mechanism, it gives you uh, a neutral pulsatile tinnitus. You see, uh, a right neutral pulsatile tinnitus due to this basal cochlear schwannoma. So there is no once again, no good treatment because surgeons don't want to operate because people hear normally. The evolution in the time is through the disappearance of the pulsatile tinnitus with the tumoral growth. It was, you see, uh, here at that time, the, the lady heard uh, the pulsatile tinnitus. Here, two years later, he was gone. There is a labyrinth fistula. A leakage of perilymph into the round window, which is filled, 
would you give fluctuating neutral uh, pulsatile tinnitus associated with the vestibular syndrome? The diagnosis is done by the, uh, on the uh, CT. This is a normal uh, CT scan of the temporal bone where uh, the round window is uh, clear. And here, in case of fistula, it is filled by the perilymph. Uh, another example, left labyrinth fistula in CT scan confirm uh, on T2 MRI. The treatment is surgical. There are general causes. Untreated high blood pressure is a possible cause, usually of bilateral pulsatile tinnitus. But in practice, uh, I don't see those patients in INR consultation because blood pressure measurement is nevertheless systematic. Hyperthyroidism or anemia, most often they reveal a local cause of pulsatile tinnitus. I have in my series a calcified aortic valvula that gave a bilateral pulsatile tinnitus. Uh, and, uh, and I don't know if I'm too, um, I finish, huh? I promise you. There are, I would like to finish with two mythical causes of pulsatile tinnitus the vascular nerve conflict. The loop of the cerebellar artery against the acoustic facial nerve, it is a possible cause of fascial hemispasm, but not of pulsatile tinnitus because the axon hear nothing. So if you have a pulsatile tinnitus, the cochlea must be stimulated. The stapedial artery, this anatomical variant exists, but it's not cause of pulsatile tinnitus in my experience. And finally, in 30% of the case, no cause is found. It is a reason for my depression. It is always neutral pulsatile tinnitus. And the pathophysiology uh, is possibly a microcirculation of the inner ear inaccessible to angiographic exploration. Apart, if you have a pulsatile tinnitus of recent onset uh, in the two first weeks, should always raise suspicion of arterial dissection and carotid dissection due to the stenosis, once again. So in emergency, I do an angiocity to rule that. The differential diagnosis of pulsatile tinnitus is a rhythmic tinnitus. When the patient describes a rhythm, rhythmic nose, but that is independent of the heart rate, it is a clonus of the soft palate of the eustachian tube. Treatment is usually carbamazepine. So the radiological assessment, I start always with an MRI pulsatile tinnitus. If I have an obvious cause, I stop. If there is no cause, I, uh, I continue. I proceed with a temporal CT scan. This is the MRI pulsatile tinnitus, non-injected large 3 litov to show you the IV fistula, T2 acoustic to show you the intracochlear schwannoma, supraortic MRI to show the stenosis, fibromuscular, etc., and T1 gradient echo to see the stenosis of the lateral sinus, the paraganglioma. In conclusion, please, please don't use anymore the word tinnitus alone. Add always an epithet. It is continuous, pulsatile, or rhythmic, and forget subjective and objective because a tinnitus is a sensation, like pain, and the sensation is necessarily subjective. The radiological assessment of a pulsative tinnitus can only be interpreted after a specialized MRI consultation. I thank you very much.